Nice to see you, Anthony. Nice to meet you, Sadia. Nice to meet you too. Yeah. And likewise. I was excited to read up on both of you. <laughs> like I said, you're experts. So I was like, let the experts go first. <laughs> I'm sure you're in the field every day with all of this. It's such a difficult time. Yeah, certainly. Um, that and I also, my focus specifically is on like psychotic illnesses, um, largely schizophrenia. Yeah. So I do think this is a little bit different from what I do yeah. in my day-to-day -day clinical work. But that being said, I also do an urgent care clinic where I am seeing healthcare workers yeah. um, a half a day a week. So, yeah. you know, um, definitely the, the pandemic has shifted things in a million ways, including mental health. So I'm, I'm, I'm grateful that um, yeah. to be here and the opportunity to yeah. be here. Uh, so important. Good now, everyone. So we're just uh, we about 25 people just sitting. We'll call them sitting down, but they're just arriving now. Thank you. Thank you. I don't know if I should take something by the window. <laughs> well, luckily, I'm in the shaded part of the house. Yes. Yeah. Yes, I told John we needed a blind today, Anthony. You agree? <laughs> oh, I'll look over here. Oh, no, over oh here. Yeah. yeah. Oh, there. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, but I, I need uh, some window covering here as well. Yeah, you do so. too. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> We've known each other for years. Um, Sadia, I, I taught Anthony at UT years ago. Yeah, it's oh, yeah. probably how many years? So over a decade that we've oh, known each other. Yeah. yeah. Wow, that's amazing. Well, the way you were communicating with each other, I'm like, oh, they're clearly friends. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just no. joining and I'm the third wheeler here. No, no, no. 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 <laughs> <laughs> we're friendly so quickly be friends so yeah exactly all right You gotta love these headphones, right? Uh, you do, you do. And they're from Parliament, so there you go. No, <laughs> no they wouldn't work. But anyways, I, I just want to welcome everybody once again properly to the Unity Health and Omso Mental Health Town Hall. Um, this week is PSW week, so I want to extend our thank you and welcome to all of the personal support workers that have joined us in this very vital and informative town hall that we are going to have here this evening, which is brought especially for you guys, the PSWs on the front lines. Um, so with that, I'm actually going to hand it over to my colleague, Ian De Silva to do the bios of our wonderful panelists. Take it away, Ian. Thank you very much, Miranda. This evening, we have Dr. Sadia Sadiqzadeh, is, who is a psychiatrist and clinician investigator in the Department of Psychiatry at St. Michael's Hospital in the University of Toronto. Her research focuses on mental health economics and health inequities. inequities. As, an educator, as an educator, she co-leads the Undeserved marginalized selective in curriculum for the psychiatry residency program at U of T. Sabia proudly identifies as the daughter of refugees from Afghanistan. She is grateful to her parents and extended family who are composed of essential workers who are often not celebrated during the pandemic, including taxi drivers, retail workers, and bank tellers. She's excited for the opportunity to connect with the Ontario Personal Workers Association, does so with humility and respect. Well, thank you uh, for the contributions PSWs made during the pandemic. Thank you, Sadia. Um, Dr. Margaret McKinnon serves as the Homewood Chair in Mental Health and Trauma and as Associate Professor and Associate Chair, Research in the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Neurosciences at McMaster University. She is also the Research Lead in Mental Health and Addictions at St. Joseph's Healthcare Hamilton and a Senior Scientist at Homewood Research Institute. Dr. McKinnon completed her PhD in Psychology at the University of Toronto, followed by a postdoctoral fellowship at the internationally renowned Rotman Research Institute at Baycrest Centre. She is an elected fellow of the Canadian Psychological Association and duly licensed as a clinical psychologist and neuropsychologist. Dr. McKinnon is well known for her work as work characterizing trauma-related illness and PTSD among military members, veterans, first responders, and survivors of childhood abuse and trauma. She has been also been involved in the development and testing of no, novel treatment interventions aimed at often unexplored aspects of PTSD and trauma, including guilt and shame, moral injury, 
disassociation and cognitive dysfunction. Dr. McKinnon serves as the chair of the federally funded PTSD Center of Excellence Research Reference Group and works closely with government sectors, including Veterans Affairs Canada and the Canadian Armed Forces. Welcome, Dr. McKinnon. And last but not least, Dr. Azini, Dr. Anthony Nazarov. Dr. Anthony Nazarov is a neuroscientist with a research focus on PTSD, moral injury, and social cognition. He is currently the Associate Scientific Director at the McDonald Franklin OSI Research Center an allied scientist at Lawson Health Research Institute and adjunct professor in the Department of Psychiatry at Western University and Department of Psychiatry at Behavioral Neurosciences at McMaster University. Prior to joining Lawson, he was a defense scientist at the Department of National Defense, Defense Research and Development Canada, investigating psychological resilience and mental health in Canadian Armed Forces personnel. Dr. Nazarov is interested in exploring the interplay between psychological trauma, moral transgressions, and how we make sense of the social world. Specifically, he is interested in understanding how we can better identify, treat, and prevent moral injury and related operational stress injuries. He is currently a co-chair of the Center of Excellence for PTSD National Moral Injury Community of Practice. His interests include knowledge translation and research participation engagement. He is co-founder of Partici Participate, a research participant engagement platform. Welcome aboard. Thank you. Back to you, Miranda. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ian. He does that so I save my voice. I'm dealing with allergies. So thank you very much, Ian. Um, so I guess we're going to get started with the first question uh, that I think some of our um, viewers are probably wondering, what is moral injury? And what is the difference between moral injury and burnout? Mm -hmm. So whoever would like to take this, please take it away. Sure, sounds good. Maybe if you don't mind, I, I'll take this first one, and then we can maybe work through some of those definitions and uh, compare and contrast burnout and moral injury. So uh, I do have a short, very short presentation of moral injury to try to uh, sort of unpack what it is, maybe the definition of moral injury, um, and then you can always uh, answer more questions. So uh, I'll try to share my screen. There'll probably be technical difficulties, so give me one second. <laughs> I've made you a co-host, Dr. Nazarov. Okay, yep, it's uh, it's almost working. One second. Oh. Okay. Okay. So you should see a screen. Brilliant. Is that correct? Yeah, perfect. So um, yeah, the, this question in terms of what moral injury is. Um, long story short is uh, we don't know. Uh, the definition is, relatively unclear. Uh, there's been a lot of work from the psychology field, philosophy, social work, spirituality, trying to pull together uh, our understanding of what it means to have a moral injury, uh, what it means to be exposed to something that's morally injurious, what are some of the symptoms that, or, or sort of uh, behavioral signs that individuals may display uh, as signs of moral injury. Uh, Currently, the best known definition to date is any psychological distress or character wound, spiritual wound, maybe undoing of character, some individuals describe it, uh, interpersonal crisis in response to either perpetration of, bearing witness to, failure to prevent, or learning about any event that transgresses deeply held personal beliefs or subjective moral standards, or one's belief about what's right and wrong, right? So, Within each of these sort of brackets, you can replace each one of those definitions and you can create that sentence to essentially have an alternative uh, definition of moral injury. What we also know is uh, betrayal is also a huge part of moral injury. Um, so this betrayal of justice by a person of authority, uh, particularly on the high stakes situation. And typically in those high stakes situations, you personally uh, are affected by those decisions of betrayal. Uh, in terms of what moral injury looks like in individuals. Uh, it could include things like alterations in self-perception, so uh, identity, alterations in moral thinking, so maybe changes in appraisal of what's right and wrong. Maybe you've always thought that this is the right thing to do, this is the wrong thing to do, but now you're not so sure anymore. Um, alterations in relational impact, so loss of belonging, maybe social isolation, um, being unable to really connect with individuals. Um, emotional aftermath, so obviously shame and guilt are very common, but other feelings like anger and anxiety, they can also come from some of these, uh, some of these exposures. 
uh, self-harm and handicapping behaviors uh, common to moral injury, but also common to other disorders um, and spirituality, right? So loss of uh, purpose of life, loss of spiritual beliefs or, or changes in those spiritual beliefs, but that's not comprehensive, right? So you can still have other symptoms that are classically associated with post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, so hypervigilance, so trying to avoid things that uh, it may be distressing that have been sort of somehow linked to, to the trauma or to that exposure in the past. So similar to post-traumatic stress disorder, where not everyone is exposed to, uh, where not everyone who's exposed to trauma uh, eventually develops post-traumatic stress disorder or, or sort of psychological challenges that individuals may face after trauma, um, it's very similar to uh, a potentially morally injurious experience, right? So just because you are exposed to something that is morally or ethically challenging, it doesn't necessarily that you will have some enduring long-term uh, psych negative psychological impact. If anything, it is possible to also have growth, same as with post-traumatic stress disorder or, or sort of, uh, sort of fear-based uh, traumatic experiences. So with a moral injury, um, it'll be sort of helpful to frame around moral injury exposure and moral injury expression. So I think that would help the conversation um, for the rest of the evening. So moral injury exposure, uh, it's any event or a sequence of events. Uh, a, a lot of times it doesn't have to be just that one particular event. Sometimes it is cumulative and it's uh, the aggregated uh, experience of, let's say, the situation at work during the pandemic, right? Um, in terms of expression and outcome, so I've listed some of those potential symptoms, but uh, we're still not sure exactly what it could look like. There are so many different examples, and I'm sure Margaret can highlight some of those as well. Um, and maybe I'll just finish at this point, and I'll switch it off to the other panelists. Currently, moral injury is not a mental health diagnosis. So classic PTSD symptoms and outcome measures may not necessarily capture all the symptoms that individuals may have after a moral injury or after exposure to something that's uh, morally distressing. Um, and not all exposures necessarily meet the criterion of, develop, of having a PTSD diagnosis. Mm -hmm. uh, so there are challenges on the clinical side to say, well, can you really be diagnosed with PTSD based on the symptoms that you're showing and sort of the, the experiences that you've had. So for some individuals, it's really, it's a term that finally describes the essence of their struggle, but from other perspectives, it could potentially be a subtype of post-traumatic stress disorder. So whether it's a separate um, thing that we can really put our finger on, or it's a, a subcomponent of post-traumatic stress disorder or some other, um, diagnoses that are well known and characterized. We're still not sure, but many signs point to yes. So maybe I'll leave it there. I have other things that I can discuss, but I'll stop myself. Maybe I can give some examples of moral injury to follow up on that. Would that be okay? Okay, so I could I actually have um, some video of some healthcare workers talking about their experience of moral injury. So maybe if I'm just able to share the screen, I'll pop that up here. Hey, good Dr. Okay. and you're made co-host now. Thanks, Ian. Thank you. So, what's do you see all my notes as well? We do. Um, I don't think it really matters, honestly. We do. We, we, we won't fuss. <laughs> so, when I think about moral injury, but I really think about moral injury as being as, as a signature wound of service. And so I think as we start this evening, I really want to honor the sacrifice and the service of personal support workers over this difficult period. Um, we're very aware that you're at the absolute front line of the pandemic and that that's not an easy place to be. It's stressful, it's difficult for you, it's difficult for your family. Um, and we just want you to know that we walk shoulder to shoulder with you in this journey. I really respect and deeply honor the work that you do. So we came here tonight to talk about moral injury and moral re injury really is, I would say, the wound of service. So it was a concept that was first developed in military members, but we began to understand over time that it likely it also impacts on first responders 
and certainly on healthcare workers. And I wanna give you some examples tonight of what a moral injury might look like in these different groups. And so this is a, um, an interview that we conducted several years ago with a military member, a veteran from Vietnam. And he's talking, as Anthony has said, about an experience he had that really violated his own morals and values. And having that violation really gave him a sense of guilt and shame. And we're gonna hear about that in his own words. So the interviewer says, what would it be like if people were to see inside of you? And the veteran says, it feels really scary. I feel like they're gonna see a kind of stain on my soul. I feel a sense of shame about being in the situation in Vietnam. And I can also feel shame about some of the things that I witnessed and I didn't do anything about. Case in point, watching idly while they threw a grenade in a hole with a guy and knowing full well what the outcome was going to be. So what this military member is describing is that he witnessed something that really violated his norms and values. And when he reflected on that even years later, he felt a sense of guilt and shame. I do clinical work with healthcare workers now. And what I hear sometimes, for example, from healthcare workers is that it's really difficult to watch someone die alone. It's incredibly difficult. And that can give rise to that same sense of guilt and shame that we see in military members. And so sometimes when we talk about this um, in our healthcare worker groups, we try to think about the, how much the person whose hand you held would thank you for being there. How much would that family thank you for being there in that person's pain? So it's really important, I think, in these situations for us to acknowledge how difficult they are for everybody involved, especially for those of you who sit there and take the place of family. And I think I wanna turn that around a little bit and think about how grateful, deeply grateful, that person whose hand you held or that family would be to you for that. And it's really difficult to process that, I understand that because this is, the, this is a situation we could never have prepared for. It essentially feels like we're at war. So this is another um, theme that this veteran talks about. And he says that if somebody found out about me, they might run. Previously, I'd been in a PTSD group and there was one of the other guys in the group who said that when he looked into the eyes of a person who hadn't been in Vietnam, it was kind of like looking in the eyes of a baby. They were just that innocent. I had that same experience. Part of me wishes I could get that innocence back. That's something I wish very often. So I think this really is something that we also hear from healthcare workers right now. It feels like we're living in a different universe than the rest of the world, right? The experiences and what we go to, into a hospital and see day to day, I don't think people outside of a hospital or a long-term care home can possibly understand right now. It can be really difficult to go home to family members as well who haven't had that experience. But let's say with first responders, it's, you could go to an accident, see somebody die, get in your car, walk in the door, and you're expected to be a mother or a wife, um, a sister, with only seconds to make that transition. And I think that's a lot of what we hear now from healthcare workers too. Their world is so different than those around them. And it's really difficult to look at people who can't understand that. Sometimes it's not just as Anthony had said that one big incident that breaks the camel's back. It could be small things. And this was a first responder who we interviewed. And he said, with those moral injuries is not just one trauma. It's like getting a little rock in your shoe and you can walk 10 steps and kick it out and it's okay. And then 10 more steps, you get another pebble in your shoe. You do that over 10 years, you walk around with all those pebbles in your shoes and it's gonna irritate you after a while. And that's what I find in my experience. That's what kills me. And some of those big things are the straw that breaks the camel's back, but sometimes it is a small. And I think that's what we're seeing in this pandemic too, is that you know, we thought that this would be one sprint, but it's turned into a marathon with a lot of sprints in between. And so as that continues on, the burden grows. And it may not be, as this, as this person is saying, just one big thing. It's this really cumulative burden coupled in with exhaustion having our regular workloads and then having the additional COVID workload, 
not knowing what needs to be prioritized and what can be let go. There's so many different things happening right now. And I think those small things can often add up to a moral injury or to a psychological injury. And we have to remember too, this is an injury. It's an injury like any other injury. So we do know that when someone forms a moral injury around some of the work that they've done, it really can be associated with that guilt and that shame and sometimes also anger. And part of that anger can come from a sense that institutions or people who were meant to protect us didn't live up to that responsibility. And so we hear that often, for example, about employers during the situation where people feel, for example, they should have been provided with better protective equipment, that they should have time off, that they should have care and concern for them. And oftentimes when we think about the anger that comes from that, I think it's important to unpack that anger and think about where is it coming from? Does it come, for example, from a sense of betrayal that somebody who was meant to protect you didn't? And we, if we really think about that really carefully, we can also think back to, for example, events during our childhood, that might have felt like that as well. And so when we think about what's happening in the present moment, it's important to also think about how it relates to the past. And so what is it that's, that's triggering in that moment? And does it relate not only to what's happening in that present moment, but also to events in the past? And that's some way to help sometimes with managing that response. We certainly know right now that most things are unpredictable. Um, for many people, I hear from many people in the healthcare sector that they've experienced war and scarcity in the past. And I would recognize and expect that many people in this group as well may come from war-torn environments or be refugees. And so part of what we're experiencing right now can feel like the past. It can be protective to have that experience because you've been exposed to it, but it can also be re-traumatizing because it brings back those feelings from childhood. And so what we really encourage people to do is to try to have control over things that they can control, recognizing that that's not everything. One tool that you always have with you is your breath, for example. So being mindful of your breath and feeling the sensation of it going in and out of your body and having that sense of control over your breath in that moment, maybe other things happening around you that you can't control, but that's one thing that you can in that moment. And that's a muscle that you can build over time. That's just one, one thing that I would probably say, right, about what the situation right now. I wanna say though that, that, that certainly many people right now also tell us that they feel that they've lost the sense of the future. They don't know when this will end. They can't predict what will happen next. And it almost feels like time has stopped in a way. And that's something very common that we're hearing from healthcare workers. But I think this is also an opportunity to strengthen our identity as well. Um, many of us came into these professions because we wanted to help. And that's what we're here for. We're here to serve and to serve the needs of others. And so that's sometimes what I encourage people to do is think about what brought us here in the first place. Why did we come? Um, I can tell you that I'm a person who actually had post-traumatic stress disorder um, many years ago and recovered from that. And so when we think about the injury that we have right now, I think we want to think about you know, what brought us here and also think about how, while this is a very difficult situation, some part of us may change and become stronger as a result of it. So we certainly know right now that moral injury extends not just to military members, not just to veterans or first responders, but also to the healthcare community, including personal support workers. And so when we talk, I've, I've actually had the privilege of being on a COVID unit. I've gone in and done some interventions in crisis situations in hospitals because we recognize how difficult it is. And some of the things that I've heard, we also have been doing interviews with healthcare workers. People talk about the incredible workload so right now we're facing not only our regular workload, but our COVID workload, and that can be very difficult. There's also constant changes in processes and directives. So one moment we're told to do something and the next moment there might be something different posted on the unit saying do something different, right? And that's a real issue I think for healthcare workers right now and often they're not told why. So that's another source of frustration that I think many of us experience. 
There's also a sense of sometimes disconnection from the team because people are being redeployed. So you're not with the people that you normally work with, or you may only be hanging in for your team. But the reason that keeps you at work is that you want to support others. I think the danger in that is that sometimes people feel that they can't take a break or that they don't deserve to take a break. I think sometimes we need to remind ourselves that you know, we do need a break, we need a pause, and sometimes we need to put our own oxygen mask on first. Um, it has been very difficult, sometimes the fatigue and the exhaustion, and I don't want to minimize that because I recognize that's very real. And I'm absolutely certain that many people in this room or in this here tonight are experiencing that. We call it a bone tiredness, especially as we've gone into the third wave. Right? I think people came into this wave exhausted. It's also been really difficult for people to balance their home and their family demands and their work demands. So what we've heard about, for example, is parents who come to the home and say, I can't parent. I'm so tired. And that's understandable. People are so tired. They're working incredibly long hours um, without a break. And oftentimes, you know, as a healthcare worker, we become the, the rule, the person in the house who wants to enforce the rules. So, you know, don't go out because you could get ill, become ill. And other people don't necessarily want to hear that because we're living in a different universe than them right now. Of course, there's that huge fear, not only of contracting COVID, but also the fear um, of contaminating others like family members. And I think that really is part of moral injury, that some of that guilt and shame that healthcare workers carry around that, will I bring that home to my family? And when it does happen, because it does happen, that's gonna be something difficult to live with as well. Um, for many people, I think we've shifted sometimes to some of us who we are. So we went into this pandemic as one person, and I think many of us will come out as a different person. And that's partially the experience of going to war, which is essentially what we're doing right now. And so of course, then we see that moral injury, that guilt and shame, and also that anger and betrayal. I'm gonna skip ahead here. I'm gonna end with a video, and this is a healthcare worker talking about his experience of moral injury on a COVID unit. And I thought we could watch this just because I think he speaks so eloquently about what his experience was. And I'm absolutely certain this particular example will, will ring true to many people here tonight. So I'm just gonna play this video. Well, I could ask you, or just thinking about this from a healthcare professional perspective and then from the patient perspective and caring for these patients, I wonder what your thoughts are there around moral injury and healthcare workers? Well, I mean, it's it's just everybody involved, whether it's the nurse, the doctor, or in my experience with the social workers. Yeah. Patients coming in first wave, very sick, and were dying. Yes. And their family members were not allowed to come and visit them. And so you had healthcare providers trying to be their family with them at their most vulnerable and potentially final moments of their life. Yeah, you would do what you could to bring in an iPad so that people could see them on a, a FaceTime or a Skype or whatever, whatever, you know, video conferencing situation uh, you could try to set up. And uh, you had uh, social workers taking constant calls from family members who were just beside themselves. And, and honestly, the social workers were getting moral injured by having to take those calls. Oh, yeah. And you know what we learned in the first wave was this policy of, of no visitation yes. was in itself morally injurious. And, 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 and into the second wave, we have to have declared family members that could come in and visit and you know, you know, again, in the first wave, we didn't want to use PPE up on family members. Visit. We didn't know how risky it would be for family members to come in and, and then take the virus that they got from the hospital and spread it. And I get it, we just didn't know, but the, the moral injury of that was tremendous for patients, family members, and, and, and all of the healthcare team. It was, it was tragic. And, and you know, we, we knew this was gonna happen. I mean, we could see this happening in New York. We could see this happening in Lombardi. It was, uh, it was not something we couldn't anticipate. We, we knew it was happening and it's just, in real time, it's it's hard to prepare for that, and 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 it's you know there will be repercussions on that for many years for many people. 
I could not agree more, Will. And you know, I think also about the health healthcare workers and how they're concerned about bringing the virus home too, and how that's such a form of moral distress as well. Mm-hmm. And thank you, Will, so much. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so I think the example here that Will gives is one that's very familiar to us. Um, it's not just, you know, being there with the person when they pass, but also having to turn sometimes family members away. And we've heard stories where, for example, a family member is watching outside while the person dies. And I would expect people here have had that experience too. Another really difficult thing, and I want to really acknowledge this in particular for PSWs who are in in long-term care or in hospital settings, where older adults may refuse care, but their family requests that they're given it. And that can be incredibly difficult as well. And I recognize that. I also know that for some people having visitors in the hospital or in the long-term care wasn't, they recognized how dangerous that was too. And so I've heard both sides of that story many times. I just want to acknowledge that it's not a one-sided issue at all. So I just want to make one final point. Whoops, sorry. Is that at the same time that we're facing this pandemic, Fortunately, as Martin Luther King reminded us, the arc of the, of the moral universe swings towards justice. And so at the same time that we have are experiencing things that are happening right now with COVID-19, we also have very important social movements to rectify racial inequality and injustice, and also other forms of minority stress, so for example, for our LGBTQ2 plus community. And this can be a source of great pride as we see these justices, these injustices being addressed, but it also brings additional stress. And we, I think it's very important for us to remember that we're not, none of us are just one part of our identity. We're not just male or female or a healthcare worker or not a healthcare worker. We could come from a war touring country, for example. Um, we may have an ability or a disability and all these things in, um, intersect with one another. And so we really think of this as a double burden right now for many people, that they're facing the pandemic and also facing the stress of the current social situation. And I wanted to acknowledge that this evening because I think that's something that impacts on many people and it's something that we need to work on and address. So I just wanted to give these examples, talk a little bit about what we've learned so far um, and hopefully bring this concept a bit to life this evening. Thank you very much for that, Margaret. And I just wanted to say, and I know that I can say this for the PSWs that are on this webinar, thank you for recognizing our reality, their reality. Thank you for recognizing everything that they have been going through, because I think many PSWs, and I know from speaking with a lot of our members that, you know, they feel that they're not being hurt. Mm -hmm. And I mean, half the time there, I almost had to stop myself from crying just because of everything our members have gone through. And and that is the reality. And and I I think it's great that we're bringing this to light. Now I'm going to ask Miss Sadia if she would like to share anything with us. Yeah, sorry, I don't pull the doctor card too much, but it's Dr. Sadia. (laughs) Um, So I wanted to say that, I mean, first of all, how can I follow up with those two wonderful presentations? They're obviously um, experts on uh, moral injury. I guess a couple of things that I wanted to add, um, and I really appreciate um, that Dr. McKinnon included in that last slide about the fact that there's so many social justice movements. And I also noticed a question in the Q&A uh, section asking a little bit about racism. I'm not sure I fully understood the question, but I think it's really important to highlight um, the fact that Overwhelmingly, uh, personal support workers and other allied healthcare providers who are not necessarily physicians per se, um, but those who I consider frontline, frontline, like physicians, yes, we are frontline, but frontline, frontline, double frontline, or frontline with an asterisk of those who are really, you know, on the ground, um, constantly providing um, more intimate care, I would say than physicians per se, uh, uh, more one-on-one sort of care or two-to-one care. And I want to just kind of highlight the fact that I know from the statistics, but also from my own personal experience, I have quite a few friends um, from my, I I grew up in Markham, Ontario, 
very uh, diverse uh, community. And a lot of my friends' parents or uh, moms in particular are personal support workers. Mm -hmm. And when I think of every one of them who are PSWs in, in my life, in my friendship circle, overwhelmingly they tend to be Black or uh, Filipinx or Latinx, um, uh, any other sort of brown identity. Um, I So I would be remiss if we didn't comment on the fact that, again, highlighting one of the questions that was asked around racism, it is important to highlight that it is largely Black, Indigenous, and people of color um, who work in as personal support workers and other forms of allied healthcare. So I'm really glad that uh, Dr. McKinnon um, brought that up. Um, I also wanted to highlight something that um, Dr. Nazarov brought up around, um, you know, like meeting the diagnostic criteria of PTSD or crossing over the threshold for what we in psych as psychologists and for me as a psychiatrist, the DSM, the Diagnostic Statistical Manual of Psychology, Psychiatry is kind of like our Bible. And it's what we are taught um, to use to diagnose certain conditions. And while moral injury and moral distress doesn't appear in the DSM per se as a formal diagnosis, that does not mean that it is uh, not a condition that one might have and could be suffering from. Um, and so I wanted to sort of flag that, you know, it can feel um, stigmatizing almost that you don't meet criteria for a formal diagnosis of something um, that appears in the DSM, you know, so it's not like a you have this and so I'm gonna give you this medication or you have this and I'm gonna refer you to this specific clinic because we don't have too many moral injury clinics or moral distress clinics, but it is incumbent upon psychiatrists like myself, family doctors, um, therapists of a variety of backgrounds um, to um, uh, who have the expertise to be able to address uh, the symptoms and signs of uh, burnout, sorry, of moral distress and moral injury not necessarily burnout, as Dr. Nazaran helped explain the difference. Um, and I also have a few slides when we have time to, um, to share resources, especially those that are affordable and or free, because I always, always want uh, folks to come out of a talk um, with concrete resources that they could use and access. So those are a few things that I wanted to add. Thank you. Do Dr. Sedizetti, did you want to share screen now or did you want to wait until after? Sure, I could do it now. Yeah, why not? Well, okay. And I just want to make sure I'm on top of this because I didn't make you at the beginning. So I'm just Yeah, there. no problem. Thank you. Okay, so share screen. Here we go. So um, I wanted to start off with a few books that I'm a huge fan of. Um, actually, let me take a step back even before that. Um, I compiled this list of resources, like I said, with an emphasis on um, access, on affordability, accessibility, etc. cetera. Um, I think about this in particular because um, a lot of, as a psychiatrist, I am a medical doctor in, therefore, um, I'm through OHEP, I'm through the Ministry of Health and Long-Term Care. And while there are many of us, there aren't enough of us. And there's always requests and, uh, to see a psychiatrist. And unfortunately, our wait list can be quite long, especially depending on where you live um, in the province, particularly harder when you uh, live in rural communities. However, one message I really want to share with the crowd is that you don't, a lot of the time, you don't actually necessarily need a psychiatrist. I want to um, give a shout out to family docs because I really do feel that they shoulder a lot of the healthcare system. They're the gateway to access to different types of specialists. You know, the people who should be seeing me are those who are more treatment resistant. So folks who've tried different types of treatments for whatever the condition might be. And if the family doctor and or therapist can only do so much, then come and turn to me. I shouldn't be the first person that you see. There should be many steps before you go and see a psychiatrist per se. And so uh, the, this list of resources is a variety of non-psych, non-MD um, resources, okay? And so I'm gonna start off with a few books that I, I really like. Um, these are not necessarily specific to moral distress or, or moral injury. Um, I've read these books, so I'm, I'm walking the walk and talking the talk and recommending these. Um, 
So without further ado, let's get started. Um, Mind Over Mood is a wildly popular book that is evidence-based. Um, it is rooted in cognitive behavioral therapy, um, and it is very much a self-help kind of uh, book where you don't necessarily need a therapist. It is a book that you kind of go through on your own time. I highly, highly recommend this. And when I learned about it when I was in medical school, I bought it for my mom right away because <laughs> I felt that my mom could benefit from something like this. Um, and like I said, I read through it myself and I highly recommend it um, to family docs to share with their patients. And then of course, with my own patients as well. Uh, by virtue of it being a book, it's not something where you're paying for ongoing therapy. So that's kind of what I like about sharing books is that you kind of read it on your own time. <clears throat> I would be remiss if I didn't comment upon um, jo Dr. John Kabat-Zinn, um, who um, is a, I want to say psychiatrist, could be a psychologist, I'm not 100% sure, but definitely a mental health uh, clinician and expert. Um, and he is credited for um, sort of integrating uh, aspects of Zen Buddhism um, into mental health treatment, specifically mindfulness. Um, he has a variety of books that you can access. This is a one very popular one, wherever you go, there you are. Um, that being said, there are other uh, accessible resources you can use too. For example, on Netflix, there is um, a, a series on, um, on, on mindfulness. I believe it's through the Explained series. Um, and I highly, if you have Netflix, I mean, who doesn't? It's a wildly popular, especially during the pandemic. Um, it actually get, goes through some mindfulness te techniques. I think it's also in collaboration with an app called Headspace. So check that out on Netflix if books isn't really your thing. And of course, there are also a variety of different apps um, that one can use. One very low cost uh, mindfulness uh, technique that I recommend to folks especially when there's trouble with sleeping and who isn't having trouble with sleeping these days um, with the pandemic and a variety of things going on, unfortunately, around the world. Um, I recommend the mind body scan, which you can access through YouTube. It's on YouTube and therefore free to access. I highly recommend it to my patients. One of the number one common complaints that I have is around how do I sleep? And a lot of the time folks are asking me for medications, but I really recommend sleep hygiene first and non as a psychotherapy, uh, sorry, non psychopharmacologic, which means non medication based treatments for sleep. Finally, I really love this book. I'm not going to say the word, but the subtle art of not giving a F word. And I really love this book. Um, I personally read it at a time where I really needed to read it. <laughs> and I found it um, incredibly useful uh, because, you know, we're social creatures and we think a lot about what our family thinks and what others think, what our colleagues think about us. And so um, this helps shed the layers around, um, around specifically that those aspects of like, I would say social anxiety. So these are a few books that I really recommend. Other mental health resources, and I wanted to highlight um, those through an anti-oppressive framework. Again, really important to me, especially again, I don't see the audience today, but I'm gonna venture a guess um, that by virtue of it being personal support workers, that a lot of mm. folks here probably do identify as racialized in some way, shape or form. And even if you don't, you know, anti-oppressive frameworks, like what does that exactly mean? I don't have the best definition for it, but the way that I look at it and the way that I try to practice my psych psychiatric practice is um, for me, an anti-oppressive framework means, you know, um, always understanding that inherently there's a power imbalance when a patient comes to see me in my clinic. I mean, no one's doing that anymore because the pandemic, it's largely virtual, but pre-pandemic and hopefully post-pandemic when we're seeing each other in person, you know, there is inherently a power imbalance in the sense that I am the doctor and you are the patient. And I'm very, very attuned to that. And I'm thinking about ways to help even out that balance. So that it could include things by just calling me by my first name. That can include things like recognizing those who are personal support workers. Your work schedule may not work with my nine to five work schedule. And so that means uh, scheduling evening clinics. 
scheduling uh, clinics in the, on the weekends. And that's a lot easier to do now in the virtual space. So these are examples of what I mean by an anti-oppressive framework. Um, and so see, these are some uh, accessible, uh, not necessarily free, but sliding scale psychotherapy clinics. This is the Healing Collective. I understand that the organizers are gonna collect this information, share it with folks afterward, okay? So it's okay if you're not, you don't have to scramble and write this all down because I understand the organizers will be collecting this information and sharing it after. So the Healing Collective is a registry of therapists um, in Toronto uh, who are therapists, uh, not necessarily, as I said, a psychiatrist per se or a psychologist per se, but say perhaps have a master's in counseling and have other forms of uh, psychotherapy um, uh, training. And like I said, they come from a commitment of working through an anti-oppressive framework. Another one is hard feelings. I love that name. Um, so again, this is another example. Um, they also have a storefront. Again, this is the pandemic, so they uh, it's not worth maybe visiting their store per se, but um, they are a storefront that sells a variety of resources and they are a registry of um, a variety of different psychotherapists, again, who offer a sliding scale and work. Uh, and, and again, you can um, kind of go through their website and kind of search through different therapists as well. Like you can see their pictures and their bios and what they specialize in, et cetera. Um, the Affordable Therapy Network. So my understanding is this is Canada-wide. It's not specific um, to Toronto or the GTA per se. Um, these are therapists that are, again, committed to anti-oppressive and committed to sliding scale and accessible, affordable psychotherapy. Oh, I didn't do an animation on bounce back, but that's okay. So these are some other mental resources I wanted to highlight especially for those who identify as people of color and or black and, or indigenous. So this is a resource that I'm really excited about. It's called Healing in Color. It's Canadian. Um, it is a registry of therapists who either identify as black indigenous people of color or they may not. Uh, that being said, they are committed to and work from an anti-racist uh, framework. Um, and so again, it's a beautiful website because you can just like type in your location, uh, type in some of the, some of your demographics or things that you're looking for, and you can search based on that to find a therapist. And again, they're interested and committed in the sliding scale, depending on what your income is like and what you can afford. I also wanted to highlight wellness psychotherapy services. In particular, I posted that picture because the woman on the left with the long flowing hair is my friend Zainab. And she is a MSW um, who started off as a, a social worker at Toronto Western Hospital and eventually opened up her own private psychotherapy practice uh, with her colleague there to the right. Um, Wellness Psychotherapy Services is very much committed to an LGBTQ open, um, anti-racist, uh, anti-oppressive framework. I, I, I direct a lot of my patients um, uh, to this clinic. I highlight the Khalil Center because I have been, as someone who identifies as my parents are from Afghanistan, um, I identify as Muslim, I get invited to speak about mental health to uh, Afghan communities and or Muslim communities of a variety of backgrounds. So I'm highlighting the Khalil Center because they're specifically rooted in, um, in, in a Muslim practice. So for anyone who's here that's watching that identifies as Muslim or knows someone who is and they're Sometimes I get asked, I actually get asked a lot by other medical colleagues, other MDs, not just family docs, not just psychiatrists, but other docs who say, hey, I have a patient who identifies as Muslim and would really like to get care through a Muslim framework. I recommend the Khalil Center. Here are some free resources. So this is absolutely free and online. So Ability CBT is through uh, the, um, the province, is through Ontario. And it, it's actually kind of funny how things worked out. I think there was a buildup and work towards slowly, slowly getting to a point where there would be free and accessible uh, mental health resources that happily kind of aligned with when the pandemic hit. So fortunately, there had been lots of hard work, um, I, I believe, through the Ministry of Health and through the province to get there. And then the pandemic hit. And fortunately for all of us, 
these resources are now, are now available. I can't emphasize how important this is um, uh, and how lucky we are that it lined up with when the pandemic hit. So ability CBT, it's ability with an I, not with a Y. And then there's Bounce Back Ontario. Uh, Bounce Back is another one that I really recommend for folks. Um, they do emphasize on their website that they're not necessarily a counseling service. They're more so a life skills uh, type of service. And it is a mix of both self-help, um, self-guided, and with the assistance of, of a therapist. Um, it is very much a skills-based uh, form of uh, support, psychosocial support and therapy. Um, I also wanted to highlight from more of a medical framework, um, CAMH, uh, early on in the pandemic, advertised that they were putting together um, healthcare resources, like specifically MD-focused or clinics. Um, so by that, I mean psychiatrists, part of a clinic, um, because everything else I suggested were not in non-MD, uh, more allied healthcare workers. Um, and I wanted to flag that while this comes from CAMH, they do say that this is in collaboration through the Ministry of Health and Long-Term Care with Ontario Shores, St. Joe's in Hamilton, um, the Royal Mental Health Center, which I believe is in Ottawa, that's where I went to medical school, and um, Waypoint as well. So uh, the CAMH website, which again, I know I have the link there, but this will be collected and shared with you afterward. There is a self-referral form. So how wonderful is that? Because a lot of the time you need a referral from a family doc, but they actually offer a self-referral, which is fantastic. So I also recommend this if, um, if, if this is something that would be helpful to you, okay? Um, it would be remiss as well if I didn't take a moment to talk about what to do in a crisis. Oh, I recognize it's 826. <laughs> um, how are we doing for time? Should I stop here, Miranda? I'm just mindful <laughs> there's only a few minutes left. <laughs> you know what, if we have a few minutes at the end, why don't you talk about this? Just because we have some burning questions. I'm sure uh, you do. Yeah, sure you we do. have some burning okay. questions I'll for you guys. Sharing. But wonderful. Thank you very, very much no for problem. that information. Our PSWs mm -hmm. are going to eat that up. Let me tell you. Any, <laughs> anything glad. for free right okay. anything for free so one of the questions actually that came up when we started talking at the beginning of this wonderful webinar was about uh the moral injury question and uh one of the questions that came up um was you know can racism be a, a, a contributing factor to this and then it said the question is based not only on the psw experience but also on the experience of management that not only witnessed the racism but also experienced it themselves could it be that service providers on a whole would experience moral injury so whoever wants to take it take it away yeah, may i answer that to start us out so way so i think one thing that we know is that being a member of a minority or racialized group often is a burden of cumulative trauma so we call that minority stress and it can be either microaggressions or it can be incidents that occur. And, you know, I think of that as a form of moral injury. Um, if we think about individuals who are meant to serve and protect and care who don't, be that coworkers, be that you know, somebody on the street, to me, that's a form of betrayal of someone who has a duty. And so we're doing work um, in our group to better understand that. And oftentimes what can happen is that this being exposed to that cumulative stress day after day after day can give rise to feelings that are similar to depression, feelings that are linked to trauma or PTSD. And so sometimes when people are brought, you know, go for care, there can be a misdiagnosis or there can be a lack of understanding about that experience. And I think it's really important that we acknowledge that. And we have a very long way to go in helping to address that. Do either of you have anything to add to that or was that the perfect answer? <laughs> it was a perfect answer. And I'll just <laughs> add on to uh, the piece about the uh, occupation as a whole, right? The group as a whole. and and experiencing that moral injury, I think absolutely, right? So part of that is also learning about the things that have happened to my friend, to my coworker, to somebody who I see 12 hours a day, right? So uh, absolutely, short answer to that piece. Excellent, thank you very much for answering that. Um, I think, you know, we hear it from our membership as well on a regular, it's an issue. 
Um, I, I wish that everyone in healthcare could work together as a strong team and respect each other's titles and, and job descriptions and duties, but unfortunately, um, they don't. And, and it, it's even gotten worse through COVID, unfortunately, <laughs> unfortunately. So um, the next question I'm going to bring up actually uh, is, you know, this has been a really emotionally and physically exhausting year. Uh, well, shall we say 15 months, right? Um, we've been on the battlefield, as Dr. Margaret likes to say, <laughs> which is true, because that's what it has been. I think we have been. Yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. And many feel powerless and feel we can't provide the type of care we want for residents and understaffing contributed to burnout. Now, we all know that uh, that short staffness and, and not enough staff, that was an issue prior to COVID, yeah. but it became very exasperated and then some through the COVID. So they're asking for suggestions on how to address this individually or at the long-term care level. Mm. Any takers? <laughs> well, I think part of it is giving yourself a sense of deservingness around taking a break. And so there's often a number of reasons why people feel that they can't do that. Um, it includes feeling that you might let the team down if you're not there that day. It might include a feeling that, you know, you might miss something because everything is changing constantly. And I think part of this is linking it back to, we do deserve care for ourselves. Sometimes we feel guilt and we feel shame about taking that time for ourselves, but we need to in this moment. And it's, it's really, you know, it goes back to that notion of we, sometimes we need to put the oxygen mask on for ourselves before we can help others. But when I, when I hear people say, you know, I don't deserve a break, I can't leave for the team. I say to them, what would you say to your daughter or your friend or your sister if they were telling you this? And then we practice saying that to each other. So often people who are healthcare workers can say to one another, you know, you really need a break. You really need to care for yourself. You need a hot meal. And saying that to hearing what you would say to someone else, turning that self-compassion to yourself and that gentleness. I think gentleness is a very important word in all of this. So how can we be gentle with ourselves and how can we be gentle with one another? That's a very, very good point. Thank you for that. Does uh, other, other doctors have anything to add to that? Or is that just like, a, again, another perfect answer? <laughs> another perfect answer. Another, perfect. another comment as well. Um, from the perspective of the military, right? So uh, individuals who are deployed are also under a lot of stress, right? So a lot of research has gone into how do we best uh, protect individuals and prepare them before they go into a stressful event but also maintain that resilience as they're enduring that stress day in and day out. And it's exactly what uh, Dr. McKinnon mentioned. Uh, even that breathing, uh, it's not just breathing. Uh, this happens in the military situation as well. They're officially trained to uh, called tactical breathing, diaphragmatic breathing. Um, and the reason that is taught in a military organization is because it works. There is evidence to show that it really refocuses that individual to focus on something that they can control. So that's one piece that I, I did want to mention. Um, another aspect of the sliding scale, right? So the sliding scale in terms of access to treatment is important, but also there's a sliding scale in terms of um, how severe is that moral injury? How severe is that, let's say, burnout? Uh, there are different terms that can be thrown around to sort of label how we feel. In one way, it could be stigmatizing that it's not a diagnosis, but in other ways, it actually works in a positive way because there could be less stigma to say that I'm burnt out, that I'm feeling stressed out, as opposed to saying that I have a, a disorder that I, I need official treatment, right? So, and what we focused on it, on the military setting is to make sure that individuals know how to recognize whether what trajectory they're going on, where they are in this continuum, let's say between green and red. Um, are they reacting to something? Do, do you feel as though maybe you're, you have displaced sarcasm? Uh, maybe you're distracted, decreased social activity. All of those are just signs, right? They're invitations for you to look inside and say, what is going on around me? Do I need a break? And yes, you do need a break. And yes, you um, you shouldn't feel guilty or ashamed that you're saying that you need a pause. Um, but at the same time, 
capturing that allows individuals to come back towards the green, right? To essentially refresh, re-energize, and be able to uh, go back to work. So just because you feel that burnout, that doesn't mean that that's, you, you'll be stuck in that space forever. Uh, it's that ability to catch yourself, to see some of those early signs, and um, to find those resources. And sometimes those resources include sleep hygiene, include you saying, I need a pause. Yeah. And I think this is a really important point that Dr. Nazaroff um, raises in that many of the times when we experience a high level of stress or trauma, and some of this really is trauma, we can have those reactions, those normal responses. And I think it's really important to remember what's helped you in the past. So at times, and what are your warning signs? So Anthony talked, for example, about displaced sarcasm or irritability. I know for myself, that's a warning sign that things are becoming too overwhelming. So I have to think about what in the past has helped me when I feel that way. And we often recommend that. Think for yourself, what are your own warning signs? What's helped you in the past? Is that calling a friend, having a hot cup of tea, having a bath? It doesn't always have to be something fancy. It can be something that's helped you before. What we would also expect is that for many people who experience those elevated symptoms or that, that response, for the majority of people that will resolve when the stressor goes away. So post pandemic, for the majority of people, we would expect them to return you know, to how they were before the pandemic, essentially. There will be some though who, who will really genuinely need care now or need care later when they've actually had a chance to get out of the battlefield, be out of that acute stress, and then when there's a pause or that break, sometimes that's when people start to really feel the emotion associated with the event. I think we just wanna be mindful of that as well. Thank you for that. You know, I actually thought of a question. Uh, we dealt with a, a member today uh, who's trying to obtain vacation. Yeah. Um, and they've been, she's been working for, and this is not just one member issue. This is many PSWs uh, issues in long-term care. They're trying to get a week off, yeah. two weeks off so that they can replenish mm -hmm. and take care of themselves. So, you know, they're being told no, yeah. um, yeah. or they're being told not till August and you can maybe get yeah. three or four days. Yeah. So then of course their stress level goes through the roof, but their yeah. question to us at the association always is how do we deal with our supervisors? How do we deal with the administrators? What can I say to them? Because I mean, you know, mental health, even though it's talked about so much, yeah. there's still a lot of kind of bad juju around it. Yeah, you don't want to say that you're having problems. You don't want to say that you're depressed, you know, like, it, because for some odd reason, uh, I mean, I was born in the late seventies, but it's like a, a crutch. You're seen as weak. And we all know in our minds that we're not weak, but we're scared to say that to our to our supervisors or DOCs or whoever. So how could the PSW convey they need time off and make that without it seeming desperate that they feel mm -hmm. that they were putting them themselves on the line? So feel free, whoever. I would guess that a lot of those managers and supervisors are feeling the same way. And so I think it's bringing that human connection to the conversation, um, acknowledging the pain and hurt that they probably are also facing at this time. And I think that can open up a really honest conversation around this. Um, what we're really encouraging within organizations is for people to have one-on-one -on -one conversations. It doesn't really work when the leader comes down on the floor and only talks to the manager, for example. <laughs> That's not good leadership, right? And so I think having that personal connection and that one-on-one -on -one and opening up to that manager, my guess would be they're feeling very much the same way. Okay, thank you for that. Please, Dr. Say. Yeah, may, may, may I ask, um, is it, uh, the, the way that I interpreted that question is that it's just, there's just not enough capacity to offer vacation? Yes, basically I, they're saying there's no capacity. Yeah. We can't give you the time off, but these PSWs yeah. are dropping like flies. So. Right. You know, it's a fine balance and I, I get it. I see it from both sides. But how does yeah. a PSW deal with that when they don't have that personal relationship or even that intimate kind of opportunity to discuss yeah. this with their management? They have to put a vacation slip in and they get told no. Right. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I really appreciate Dr. McKinnon's advice, but at the end of the day, you know, um, it really does seem to be a supply and demand issue, unfortunately where it sounds like the advice is more so on how to navigate those tricky conversations. But the reality, unfortunately, is that 
it's not that, at least from what I understand, it's not that people don't want to give vacation. It's just difficult to be able to accommodate that. Is that fair to say? Or yeah. Yes, okay. yes, yes. I'll be, I'll be, I'll just do facial expressions. Yes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I'm, and you know, it, it's, I don't want to steer too much off topic, but I'm a theme that has been, I, I think there's been a lot of momentum, which I'm excited about. And I'd like to see even more. Um, but I, I, for example, I, I just finished up my term, but I was part of the steering committee for health providers against poverty. Mm -hmm. And we worked very closely with decent work and, and health network. Um, and one of the policy wins ish, I think is that there's a lot more recognition about the importance of, of paid sick leave, not the same thing as vacation. And sometimes people use their vacation time for when they're sick with COVID, which is inappropriate. Um, but uh, there's been a lot more momentum and politi political and public support, or at least public support, if not political, on um, the importance and the value of paid sick days, because it has an important contribution to helping to control the virus and the spread of the virus, because we don't want people to show up uh, with symptoms. But at the same time, recognizing a lot of people work, live paycheck to paycheck mm -hmm. and unfortunately feel the pressure to have to show up to work uh, while sick. And so um, I wanted to sort of share a decent work and health network. They're an Ontario based organization. They are a think tank and advocacy group. They have a wonderful and strong listserv where they're constantly sending information um, and a variety of different advocacy initiatives that anyone can get involved in, um, including calling MPPs, including calling, um, and, and it's going to call it phone zaps, where we all get together and call at the same time um, to try and push the conversation around paid sick leave. Um, I know that, um, that uh, Premier Ford um, had suggested three days, but three days is nowhere close to the incubation period um, and the time for resolution um, for COVID um, infectiousness. Uh, so yeah, I, I wanted to sort of, I appreciate the questions around vacation, but I, I really want to, um, uh, to inform folks that there are a lot of us working um, in solidarity, not just with allied healthcare workers, but just like workers in general uh, lots of actions that happened on May Day, on May 1st, um, and I really recommend getting involved with or at least joining the listserv for a decent work in health network uh, to help advocate for, for such important um, initiatives that also ultimately go hand in hand with moral distress and moral injury. Like, do I show up to work sick? You know, like that is a, a form of moral distress and a form of moral injury in and of itself. You know, and if I don't go in, I could lose my job or I may not get paid and not be able to afford to support my family. So these are really important issues as well. Excellent. Thank you very just, much. Uh, Please, Dr. Uh, Anthony. To that, yeah, yeah. Just, um, you know, I think realistically speaking, when you're getting to the point of burnout, when you're having, uh, you're already overworked. You're already seeing signs that, you know, you're not doing that well. Let's say you're not ill. You don't need to seek psychotherapy, but you do need a break, right? You need a break now, you need vacation now. You may not have the resources or the capacity or the strength or the energy to find those emails, to, to write those emails, uh, to advocate for global change within your occupation or within that organization. Uh, you know, Somebody who has um, in, in, you know, uh, adequate sleep, uh, uh, absolute time dedicated to, to this cause already has issues understanding which direction to go in terms of making change in an organization. So to um, sort of ask somebody who's already at that breaking point to try to make that change, it may be difficult, right? So I think um, also, going back to that military system of having a buddy, right? So at that point, when it is becoming critical and you can't necessarily, or you feel as though you can't turn to your management or to your institution for support, I think it's important to find a peer or somebody who you can soul with um, beside you who you work with all the time. And a lot of times 
individuals may not necessarily feel comfortable with explaining that I don't need this for vacation just because I want to, um, you know, travel, right? It's like, I want, I, I need this to feel better, right? I need this to go back and recover and re-energize. Sometimes individuals are uncomfortable with saying that to managers. Sometimes you can't even get those one-on-one -on -one instances as well. So you have to rely on other sources of support potentially. And sometimes those, uh, that buddy peer system within an organization can maybe assist with either facilitating that vacation time because and let's say if you don't have that face time with that manager maybe your buddy does so that's just sort of my advice in terms of what has worked in certain organizations but again it, it really is on an individual basis and sometimes it is very difficult but again sorry sorry for this uh you know extensive answer but uh going back to uh, margaret's point about that everyone has to make a difficult decision. So whereas you're posed with a difficult decision right on the front front lines, um, as was said, the managers are also very likely going through those same exact issues with having to make those very, very difficult decisions to say that, no, we can't have uh, this vacation now because of you know X and Y and Z issues. So I think I agree uh, that human connection is so important. Excellent. Thank you very much for that. I think our PSWs are getting a lot of information from this, um, as I know they have lots of questions. So I'm just going to jump in a couple questions here. One thing here I thought we should talk about is we keep calling our condition one of burnout. Mm. Are we hiding depression by using this word instead? And how can it be possible to differentiate the two? Is it even productive to do so? So whomever would like to take that. I, I can take this one first. Um, just like with moral injury, I think with burnout, uh, it is difficult to define what burnout really looks like, right? So having um, sort of your experiences placed in a spectrum, it's really hard to say, am I feeling burnout? Am I not feeling burnout? Um, personally, when you're seeing yourself uh, having those symptoms, recognizing those symptoms early, um, calling it with whatever name, whether it's uh, moral injury or burnout, it's a sign that perhaps something needs to change. Either you need to change things in the workplace, uh, let's say through uh, you know, requesting leave, uh, or change in your day-to-day -day behavior, like ensuring that you're taking breaks and um, as simple, again, as breathing, as making sure that you're drinking enough water, because a lot of times you're so... Um, focus on those tasks because they, they seem like they're never ending you forget to actually take care of yourself mm -hmm. um, and those those small self-care actions do accumulate as well um, so in terms of burnout is it um, a waste of time to focus on burnout uh, personally i don't think so uh, there, i think there's a lot of work that still needs to be done from the research perspective to understand how burnout is is different from moral injury is it different from depression um, is it somewhere on a continuum towards depression? Is it somewhere on a continuum towards moral injury? Uh, perhaps, but I think um, recognizing burnout is already better than not being able to recognize that there's some sort of change that an individual does need help. If I may jump in and add um, uh, the bread and butter of my job and one of the most common disorders that I treat is major depressive disorder. Um, just because it's uh, um, just in terms of from an epidemiological perspective and comparing it to different conditions, depression is one of the more common ones, um, along with anxiety disorders. And um, the, the DSM would say that a major depressive disorder uh, requires at least one of um, anhedonia, which means inability to enjoy things, things that you once enjoyed are no longer enjoyable, or, and or, um, low mood. So that's what we traditionally think of when we use the word depressed colloquially, like when we throw around the term, um, you know, we think about low mood. 
but it doesn't necessarily have to be that. It could also be the inability to enjoy things that one once did. In addition to that, there has to be at least five other symptoms of a list of 10. So that can include sleep disruption. It can include um, uh, feelings of worthlessness and guilt. It can include having low energy. Again, this is all changed from baseline, right? Um, it, uh, affecting concentration, affecting appetite. That's a huge one that I don't think people think a lot about. Um, it is the appetite category includes no longer enjoying the foods that you once did, right? So that falls kind of along the lines of spectrum of anhedonia I said earlier, but it can also include just losing your appetite, not able to eat as much, and or it could be eating more than usual, depends on the person. But the key part is the change in appetite. Um, and then another aspect can be psychomotor agitation, or I don't like that we still have this word because I always want to get the R word out of our language, but it's retardation, uh, psychomotor retardation. So if that means, you know, that constant feeling of being on edge or feeling very restless and or feeling like you're walking underwater is the way that I like to phrase it to patients. Um, feeling like your body is a lot more gravity than another person to keep yourself up, for example. And another uh, feature, um, maybe, doesn't have to be, but maybe, uh, thoughts that are so dark that they turn to suicidal thoughts, thoughts of self-harm or wanting to end one's life. That one is in particular a red flag whether one is, has, is meeting criteria for a major depressive episode or not, doesn't matter. If it's crossing into the territory where one is thinking of taking their life, that's when their red flags and the signs should go off. Um, and that should include talking to a healthcare provider. And if it's ever getting to a point where it's imminent, it would be calling 911. Um, so I highlight these just to say that there are actually clear diagnostic criteria to meet the um, diagnosis for a major depressive episode. Now, I don't want you to walk out of here and go do your own kind of checklist and decide for yourself whether you meet the criteria or not. It's just that if you have that question, it's on your mind, you're wondering whether you do, I do recommend going to your family doctor. Family doctors are perfectly capable of making a diagnosis about depression or not, um, and then work with you in supporting you if you do meet criteria for depression. I really like the question around, is it even worthwhile asking this or are we masking depression with the term burnout? I don't have a perfect answer for that. I think again, it kind of speaks to the stigma issue as well, where it might be more face-saving to say it's burnout as opposed to saying it's a major depressive episode or a major depressive disorder, because like, who can't say that they've experienced burnout or aren't experiencing burnout during this pandemic. Like show me someone who isn't. There's just different levels of it mm -hmm. for sure at different times of the pandemic, but not everyone's necessarily, and thank God for that, meeting criteria for a major depressive episode or a major depressive disorder, which is a good thing. We don't want that. Um, and so I don't have a clear answer as to whether that's a good thing or a bad thing, but I, I just hope that I can add something practical here where if you're ever asking yourself, is this now crossing into territory where I might need a medication or I might need something more formal in terms of therapy, please go and see your family doctor who can easily help you in, in figuring out whether that is the case or not. So I just wanted to add that about, uh, about major depressive disorder. Thank you very much for that. I think that's really informative. I think a lot of people don't realize that they can go to their GP and they can ask these questions and that they're more than capable of assisting them and helping them. And if they need, if they think they need more further help, then it's you guys uh, kind of thing that comes into play. So um, now I think because we are coming up to nine o'clock, I think this is a great opportunity for you guys to have your closing remarks Add anything that you would like to convey to the PSWs, any information that we think we missed. This will not be the last one. I I am sure um, the next one we can go big or go home if you guys would like. But um, how about we start with uh, Dr. Margaret for closing remarks? Yeah, I think what I want to say is that, you know, we honor your service. We honor your sacrifice. Um, I think it's really important to be witnessed and to have people hear the hurt and the pain that you experience 
and to be believed. And that's often one of the first parts of healing. So I just want to honor everything that you do and the sacrifices that you make. Awesome. And who would like to go next? Thank you, doctor. Thank you, Margaret. Um, from my perspective, I think uh, making sure that you remind yourself that you are deserving of a break um, is probably one of the most important things because it's a lot easier to pull back when you're just a few steps off as opposed to when you're uh, further down, right? So I think uh, recognizing changes in yourself, uh, maybe seeing what others are uh, saying at home, um, catching and then being proactive about it. I think uh, uh, you owe it to yourself to do that. Um, Thank you. I guess in terms of uh, last thing I'd like to say is that I obviously I believe in it because I practice it um, and I'm a consumer of it, but I really do believe in the power of psychotherapy. Um, I don't think, I, I strongly believe that everyone can benefit from it at some point in their lives. I really wanna destigmatize um, talk therapy. It really, like that should be out the door by now. <laughs> um, and I, I feel very uh, strongly about, um, again, it was really important to me to share with you all uh, because it can be expensive if it's not OHIP covered. Um, I wanted to really emphasize that there are um, services that are offered for free and or through a sliding scale, depending on your income, it's out there. Um, a lot of those resources that I shared with you, I've only learned about in the last few months myself. Um, and so I don't think it gets enough exposure. So please take advantage of some of the resources that I've shared and, and share it with your friends and colleagues, et cetera. And also, um, I want to highlight that a lot of research in psychotherapy has shown that overwhelmingly the, the, the key factor is the relationship between the therapist and the individual. If you take, it doesn't even matter what form of psychotherapy it is, what type it is, because there's so many different forms and types. And, and, and at the end of the day, overwhelmingly, the research shows that it is about the, the therapeutic relationship between the provider and the patient and or individual, depending on whatever word you want to use. Um, and so sometimes it requires shopping around. Sometimes it means you try a session with someone, doesn't work out, you move on to someone else. Don't give up. But if there's one thing that I can really offer here, I, this is the spiel I give to my mom. <laughs> I'm trying to get my mom to access psychotherapy. You know, it's important. Uh, don't underestimate it. And there are resources out there. A lot of it is self-stigma. Yeah. Um, and so I encourage you to go, go and try and access it. Give it a try. Yeah. If I could just follow up on that. I mean, I'm a person yeah. who, who suffered from PTSD and depression. And I was told that I would ruin my career by talking about that. I think it's like that opposite. I think we have to challenge the stigma that surrounds it and really be open and say, you know, I accessed psychotherapy for years um, and it saved my life. So I think it's really important just to say the stigma. Yes, it does exist, but we can overcome that. Thank you for that. And I'll end by saying that I did see someone for many years as I have yeah. PTSD. Yeah. So I yeah. will say that out there for yeah. PTSD. Yeah. Yeah. So if, if they if they think that they can't say it, I just said it to a whole lot of people on a really? webinar. And yeah. I'm fine with it because I'm good today because I sought help. Yeah. Um, so that is very important. So I just want to thank each and every one of you for coming out today or tonight, shall I say. Uh, it's been a long day, I'm sure, for a lot of us. Mental health is an important uh, factor in our work. And I cannot thank each and every one of you doctors for coming out tonight and sharing information with our personal support workers. Again, I do have to say a huge shout out to Unity Health and Dr. Strauss and Christine uh, for their un amazing partnership with the association. And with that, I'm going to say good night and hope you guys all have a wonderful evening. Stay safe. And again, happy PSW week, everyone. Yes, Take, happy care. Bye, everybody. Take care. Take care. It's Bye -bye. a pleasure.